Well, shalom, dear friends, and welcome to this session. It's the second to last one of the Bible on one foot. In our uh, previous session, we started a study of the age of grace. And let rem me remind you once again that although these uh, periods in history, these eras, these dispensations have labels attached to them, like promise and law and grace, it doesn't mean that uh, prior to the age of grace, there was no grace of God in the world. Uh, the text of Scripture throughout the Old Testament um, emphasizes and proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that God was being gracious to people. Um, you know, as early as the um, fallout from the uh, Garden of Eden, um, it was God's grace that uh, promised Adam and Eve that the seed of woman would come, uh, the Messiah. Uh, to save mankind from sin. So grace is throughout all of the uh, eras, all of the dispensations, the ages that we've studied so far, but it's really prominent uh, in um, uh, this one that we're currently uh, studying. So this is the second session. Let me go ahead and kind of review what we've done already um, like the law was divided, the, the age of the law was divided into three sessions, three Bible study uh, sessions. So we spent a lot of time on the age of the law. The same thing is true, or a similar thing is true of the age of grace. Uh, there are two charts uh, by Dr. Ede that uh, we have used and are going to be using today to study the um, age of grace. And uh, this, this age, the age of grace, is divided into three sections. In our last uh, section, uh, in our last session, we studied the section, uh, the one-third of the uh, age of grace, that was about the life and ministry of Yeshua, of Jesus Christ. So uh, we talked a little bit about the uh, beginning of the New Testament canon, the uh, books of the New Testament. We talked about some of the um, uh, really uh, prominent uh, events in, in the life of uh, Yeshua, the birth of Jesus, baptism of Jesus, his earthly ministry. And what I focused on there was the Sermon on the Mount, because that was the giving of the law for the uh, New Covenant. Uh, for those who would be under the new covenant, and of course, those were the believers in Jesus, who uh, believed in him and were born again, and uh, by doing so, uh, they were removed from the authority of the law of Moses and placed under the authority of the law of the new covenant. Some people call it the, the law of Jesus or Yeshua, some people call it the, the law of freedom or liberty, some people call it the law of the New Testament. You get the idea. Uh, it's drawn uh, largely from Jeremiah 31, 31. We talked about the triumphal entry into uh, Jerusalem, where Jesus rode in on a donkey, uh, not a conqueror's uh, vehicle, but a servant's vehicle. Yeshua is a servant king. He wants to serve those who are under his uh, dominion. Um, actually, that took place on the proper day of the Levitical feast, where the lamb for the Passover uh, was chosen from the flock. That would be on the 10th of Aviv or Nisan. Those are the, um, the uh, uh, various names for the um, first month of the Jewish uh, religious uh, calendar. That's when Jesus presented himself to be the lamb of God. Um, uh, after the um, uh, the Last Supper, Yeshua and his disciples went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, where he was betrayed by one of his own, Judas. He was arrested uh, by the uh, temple authorities and uh, taken to stand trial before the uh, high priests, uh, also uh, before the Sanhedrin. Ultimately, his trial brought him to the uh, Roman governor, uh, Pontius Pilate, who reluctantly um, uh, Pilate tried very hard to release Jesus. He didn't think that Jesus had done anything deserving of death, uh, but eventually the pressure of the crowds, um, uh, really spurred on by the, uh, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, among the leadership of the Jewish people, 
uh, insisted on his death. And so they used the Roman method of execution, which was crucifixion. Uh, Jesus spent um, uh, some time uh, on uh, Passover day uh, on the cross, died at the appropriate hour of the day when uh, the uh, Passover would uh, would be um, uh, would be put to death, would be uh, prepared uh, for uh, eating, and uh, uh, would would be consumed by the uh, by the faithful. Uh, you'll notice that the red ribbon of salvation flows through all these events in the life of Jesus. He was of the proper genealogy. He was of the uh, tribe of Judah, so he was a legitimate uh, king of uh, Israel. And of course, the uh, promise of the coming of the seed of woman comes to its fulfillment here on the cross. Uh, he dies there on the cross. His body is buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, this picture that I have uh, on our screen for today is a picture of the tomb that is in the garden uh, uh, tomb um, location in uh, Israel, which uh, I believe is the proper location of the crucifixion and burial of uh, Yeshua. Uh, the other uh, candidate is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, which I think has uh, less uh, evidence going for it. But anyway, here's a picture of the uh, tomb. His body was only in there for three days and three nights, uh, came out victoriously, as was predicted in the Tanakh, in the uh, Old Testament, uh, in the uh, book of Jonah, that just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man would be three days and three nights in the, the heart of the earth and would emerge alive and well in his uh, resurrection. Um, uh, also, the uh, ascension occurred uh, 40 days after uh, his uh, resurrection. And we studied about all that stuff. So today we're going to turn our attention to uh, the day of Pentecost, which begins the second section of the Age of Grace, which is the age of uh, the age of the church, and uh, that will be followed by the great tribulation period. Um, I'll remind you once again that these uh, sections on the chart are not to scale. Uh, if they were, then the life and ministry of Jesus, uh, thirty-three years, uh, would be the largest section. So this would be uh, only a few years uh, in length. Uh, we know that the Great Tribulation will be exactly seven years uh, in length, and uh, so far we don't know how old the uh, dispensation or the uh, uh, age of the church is. Uh, Dr. Ede calls it the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So let's go ahead and turn to the big chart for the second and third sections of the uh, Age of Grace. Let's take a look at what we'll be studying uh, today. Uh, the sixth dispensation, the word ecclesiastical, I think that's a Latin word. Um, actually, it's a Greek word. Uh, ecclesia is the Greek word from the Greek New Testament for the age of the church. So this is the church age. Again, Dr. Ede calls it the dispensation of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. I don't know that the Bible uses that term for this period, this dispensation or this age in history, uh, but it's certainly uh, legitimate. Uh, I mean, it, it certainly makes sense. The uh, first section, the life and ministry of Yeshua, was obviously the dispensation of the Messiah, of the uh, Christ. And then when he ascended into heaven, uh, the Holy Ghost kind of took over for him and uh, played a very prominent uh, role. Of course, the Holy Spirit had been active in the world uh, since the very beginning. Uh, even in the creation uh, story, the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. So the Spirit uh, and the Son of God were involved in creation and so forth. So uh, Ede calls this a dispensation of the Holy Ghost. Not sure how biblical it is, but I'm uh, in perfect uh, agreement uh, with it. Uh, we will start with the descent of the Holy Spirit, and um, in the next screen, we'll talk, um, well, we won't talk about the Spirit, and one of the coming screens, uh, we will talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, particularly in relationship to people, uh, how he deals with uh, people in the various phases of his ministry to them. Uh, the descent of the Holy Spirit is a reference to the day of Pentecost. That was an Old Testament 
a festival, a Levitical feast. Uh, it always happened in the, su in the summer months, uh, and it was always 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits, which was one of the springtime festivals. And the Feast of First Fruits really is a celebration of the, uh, uh, of the uh, resurrection of, of Yeshua. Um, that will be followed by the apostolic uh, period, and uh, that period is summed up best in the uh, book of the Acts of the Apostles. So here are some of the texts. Well, uh, here are some of the subjects uh, that we'll be uh, dealing with in this, um, uh, in this study for today. The descent and dis uh, dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Dispensation of the Holy Spirit comes from there. We will talk about the rapture of the church, which is this uh, event that uh, brings an end to the uh, age of the church and uh, initiates, uh, it's kind of a milestone for the beginning of the uh, great tribulation. I really appreciate the fact that Dr. Ede added a note here. Uh, NB, I believe, is a uh, like a Latin abbreviation for, uh, I don't know, note bene or something like that, uh, which means uh, take note of this. Uh, or note well, or something like that. And uh, Dr. Ede says the rapture timing is uncertain. Now, first of all, that means a couple of different things. For one thing, Jesus emphasizes repeatedly uh, throughout his ministry that no one knows the day or the hour of the return of Yeshua. And that is definitely a reference to the rapture of the church, which we will define uh, from biblical texts, uh, but um, no one knows when this is going to happen. It could happen today. In fact, it could happen before this video concludes. So if I disappear from this video, that will mean I've been raptured, and I hope you're not left behind to watch the rest of the uh, video. So it could come at, at any time, and Yeshua tells us all that we should be ready for it to happen at any time. We should be uh, in a very good relationship with God and so forth. So it can happen at any time uh, for, uh, you know, for us personally and in history. Uh, but he may also be referring to the fact that um, uh, Bible scholars, uh, students of the Bible, uh, are um, sometimes disagreed about when this rapture is going to happen. Now, dispensational premillennialists um, almost all agree that the rapture is going to happen before the uh, Great Tribulation begins, and so they are called uh, pre-tribulational the rapture happens pre or before the tribulation, pre-millennialists, and that means the second coming of Christ will be before the millennium, which follows on the uh, next chart that we're going to look at. Uh, some uh, scholars say that the rapture and the second coming of Christ are the same thing. So since they place the rapture at the end of the tribulation, they are called post-tribulationists. And um, Pat Robertson, the host of the 700 Club, is the best example I can think of, probably the most prominent one, uh, who believes that the rapture and the second coming of Christ are the same event. So uh, Pat Robertson is post-tribulational. Uh, and then there are some people who think that the rapture happens about halfway through or at the midpoint of the Great Tribulation. And the tribulation is divided into two significant um, time frames, uh, both of which are three and a half years long. So uh, those who think that the rapture happens in the middle of the tribulation are called, guess what, mid-tribulationists. So there is some disagreement about when the rapture uh, happens. I uh, personally am just thoroughly convinced that it's pre-tribulational, and uh, uh, I am very glad that I'm so convinced because this great tribulation is a period of time, is not a time frame that I want to live through on the earth. I would much rather be in uh, heaven. So when the rapture occurs, you know, there will be some events that the Bible tells us about that will happen in heaven, and also some events, very negative, uh, violent, um, de deadly events happening uh, on the earth. So we'd all much rather be in heaven. So we all hope that the pre-tribulationists are right. 
Uh, so the rapture is one of the subjects. We'll talk about the Antichrist, who really has uh, earthly dominance uh, during uh, this period of time. We'll talk about the tribulation period, uh, which is that last seven years of this segment of time. Uh, it's also known as the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's also known as the 70th week of Daniel. Uh, Daniel uh, predicted these um, uh, 70 weeks of years, 490 years, 483 of them have already happened. So there is uh, seven years left, the 70th week of uh, Daniel. And then, of course, we have the second coming or the second advent of Christ. Again, the text to look at, especially for the apostolic period, are the Acts of the Apostles. And by the way, uh, this is the text that all churches, modern churches, should use uh, as a model of what the church uh, should look like. And uh, in my experience, very few uh, modern-day churches look uh, much like the uh, apostolic church. Matthew uh, chapters 24 and 25 are called the uh, Olivet Discourse, where Jesus predicted the future. He had a lot to say about the Great Tribulation and uh, his return in power and great glory, the second uh, coming. Uh, I think he even had some things to say about the rapture of the church. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 is where the Bible gives, I guess, uh, I guess the most vivid and detailed description of the rapture of the church, and we will look at that and also some material from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 by the Apostle Paul. Uh, as far as the Great Tribulation is concerned, the go-to books of the Bible are Daniel in the Old Testament and Revelation uh, in the New Testament. So let's go ahead and begin our study of each uh, kind of segment, each uh, illustration uh, of this uh, chart. And we're going to start with this little tiny reference here to Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 29. So let's go ahead and look at that. And uh, these, uh, these verses uh, from Galatians have to do with the relationship between Jews and Gentiles, how we are one in Messiah. So we will look at Galatians. We'll also look at a significant passage from uh, the book of Romans. Let me go ahead and uh, read Galatians 3 first, and then we'll comment about some of the uh, book references that I want to uh, share with you. So in Galatians 3, 18 to 29, uh, the Apostle Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. And the Greek word uh, from the New Testament for Gentile is Helene, Helene, uh, I'm sorry, it's Helene, Helene, kind of like the name Helen, uh, which means Greek. It's the Greek word for Greek, like the Greek culture and the Greek language. Uh, it is a synonym for Gentile. Uh, in Hebrew, a Gentile is a goy, and uh, in uh, the Greek New Testament, it's called an ethnos. But when it when Paul talks about the Greeks here, he's talking about the Gentiles. So Jew and Gentile uh, are one uh, in Messiah. There's neither Jew uh, nor Gentile. So when we come to faith in Messiah, uh, God no longer uh, kind of distinguishes between Jews and Gentiles. We're all one. Now, uh, each, uh, you know, Jews and Gentiles both have a, uh, an ethnic heritage they, they come out of. Uh, there are some uh, Jewish people who are uh, in the body of believers in the church, uh, whose background, uh, whose um, uh, family heritage is Jewish. Uh, if there has been no intermarriage uh, in their family between Jews and Gentiles, then they have pure blood of the um, family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and there's no doubt that they're, they have a Jewish heritage. Uh, Gentiles come from all different nations, cultures, and family trees, uh, but when they become believers in, in Yeshua, we, we, are all, we are all one. Um, uh, he goes on to say, there's neither slave nor free man. Uh, in the ancient culture, uh, slaves were looked at as like second-class citizens, or maybe even a lower number, third or fourth-class citizens. And then free men were people who were, um, um, you know, free to make their own choices. They didn't, uh, um, they had their own businesses, uh, owned their own land and things like that. So uh, masters and slaves we're talking about here. 
And uh, obviously, um, the, the people who joined the church uh, had a background. Some of them came from slave families, and some of them came from free uh, families, uh, perhaps even being masters of slaves. But again, uh, when we are born again, God doesn't look at, he doesn't distinguish between these two groups. So we're equal. Um, very a few people would have said in those days that a slave is equal to his master, but God looks at us that way. Neither male nor female uh, in Messiah, in the faith. And uh, obviously, um, some of the believers are male and some of them are female. But again, God doesn't distinguish. Um, um, he doesn't prefer one group over another in uh, dealing with believers. For in union with Messiah, you are all one. Uh, also, if you belong to Mashiach, you are of uh, you are seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. Remember, Abraham was the prominent individual uh, in the age of promise, uh, where we learn that faith is credited to us as righteousness. And of course, he passed that heritage on to uh, his um, sons. Um, Abraham uh, had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. And uh, that was the family heritage uh, passed on through the ages up until the time of Jesus. So when we become believers, when we're born again, we join one family. But what family is that? Is it the family of Judaism or is it the family of a Gentile religion like Christianity? Now, I will tell you that this question has gotten muddled uh, through the years. Uh, because um, uh, actually one of the things that we're going to uh, talk about uh, in our lesson for today is the fact that during the, um, uh, the life and ministry of Yeshua, even when he was doing ministry, he was doing it um, almost exclusively uh, to the lost chief of Israel, to the Jewish people. He was reaching out to them. Uh, because the Bible had said, uh, the prophet Isaiah had said that uh, the gospel would go out of Zion, and that it was through the Jewish people that the nations of the world would hear the gospel and become part of the uh, family of, uh, of faith. So um, uh, Jesus offered uh, ministry almost exclusively to the Jewish people and kind of avoided the Gentiles except on a few uh, occasions. Uh, but when he uh, rises from the dead and commissions his disciples, he tells them to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Uh, so the paradigm changes. Uh, Judaism is not supposed to remain this uh, segregated um, uh, uh, community that uh, avoids intermarriage and tries to preserve the faith at any cost, no matter where they're living, no matter what their culture, surrounding culture is. Um, it's not like that anymore uh, at the point of uh, really the day of Pentecost. Um, uh, Judaism expanded uh, by uh, going out into the whole world and making uh, disciples of Yeshua. Um, and they were very successful of that. It, it didn't take very long, a couple of hundred years, until there were hardly any Jews left in the church. And uh, there were a lot of Gentiles there that um, uh, were not all that supportive of the Jews uh, being part of their church. It had become so Gentile in its orientation uh, that Jews felt not welcome, and in fact, they were persecuted by the Gentile Christians and kind of driven out of the, the church. Fortunately, in recent times, the uh, Messianic Jewish movement has arisen, and Jewish people are joining the uh, Christian church uh, once again, and I delight uh, about that. And uh, uh, I mentioned to you in the last uh, session, we are using the complete Jewish Bible, uh, an English translation uh, by uh, uh, Dr. David Stern, a Messianic Jewish guy, uh, to just give us some uh, feel for uh, Messianic Judaism and the terms that they use and the sensitivities that are involved. But the Messianic Jewish movement is growing by leaps and bounds. Lots and lots of Jewish people are receiving Jesus as their Messiah and joining the church. So most non-believing Jews, no most non-Messianic Jews uh, would say that um, uh, in order for a Jewish person to become a, a believer in Yeshua, he must stop being Jewish and join the Gentile Christian church. 
So he leaves Judaism and converts to Christianity, a Gentile religion. Well, it didn't start out that way. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, really because of the uh, sinfulness of, of, of the church uh, through the centuries, uh, that is a, a kind of a practical paradigm. But the original paradigm was that uh, everybody in the church on the day of Pentecost, virtually everyone, uh, was Jewish. There's one guy, I think, uh, no, I, uh, there's, a, there's a small group of people uh, that are mentioned as uh, uh, in the uh, Pentecost narrative in Acts chapter 2. Uh, there's a group of people that are called proselytes from a, a various place, and that would be Gentile converts to, to Judaism. But uh, basically, um, all the, uh, all the, almost all the believers were almost exclusively Jewish. Um, all of the uh, authors of the Bible are Jewish. Some people object that Luke was Gentile, but there's no evidence that he was. Uh, so uh, the, um, the Jewish culture, the Jewish um, influence uh, in the early days of the church, uh, Book of Acts uh, period, is uh, prominently uh, Jewish. And, and we will see from the next verse uh, that uh, ge when Gentile people joined uh, the family of faith, uh, they became Jews. Now, that is a controversial, <laughs> that's a controversial uh, statement. So let me back it up with uh, Romans chapter 11, and we'll begin reading at the 16th verse. Uh, in in chapter uh, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, uh, Paul is uh, discussing the relationship of Jewish and Gentile uh, Christians in the early church and the future for um, uh, for Jews uh, who believe in Yeshua. Um, probably most Christians believe that because the Jews rejected Jesus and his first advent, God is done with them, and he has uh, all of the promises have converted over to uh, being given to the Gentile Christian uh, church, but that is just not true, and Paul refutes that in these three chapters. And in this portion that we're going to look at, he uses two illustrations from, uh, from nature, I guess, to illustrate the point that he's trying to make, that when Gentiles become believers in Yeshua, they convert to Judaism. So uh, he starts out, now, if the challah, and uh, I don't know if you know what challah is, it's delicious bread. It's bread made with yeast, and uh, it was, uh, a, uh, actually, it's a, a term for a ceremonial bread uh, that can be offered in sacrifice. So um, uh, on the day of Pentecost, that was the one feast of the uh, Levitical um, religious year, where leavened bread could be, and in fact was required to be uh, offered to uh, God. Uh, some people have said that it represents the joining of uh, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, perhaps that would that would be appropriate if that uh, is the case. Uh, challah is also used on uh, Yom Shabbat, on Sabbath celebrations, usually uh, on Friday evening. Uh, there's a loaf of challah uh, that is uh, baked and used as uh, kind of a ceremonial bread, along with a cup of wine. Uh, even for non-Christian uh, Jewish people, um, yeah, for um, uh, celebrations there, for religious purposes. So if the challah is uh, offered as first, uh, that is offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole uh, loaf. Usually the challah was a loaf of bread that was baked and uh, that was baked, and then a portion of that would be broken off and given to the priests as an offering, and then you could eat the rest of it. And uh, uh, Paul is just saying, if the first fruits is holy, the part you break off for God, then the whole loaf is. So you are eating holy, sanctified bread. Well, let's forget about that illustration, because the next one is the most important. He starts talking about a couple of different olive trees. One is a, culted, a cultivated olive tree that represents Judaism, and the other is what he calls a wild olive tree that represents uh, Gentiles. So if the root, uh, the root of that uh, cultivated olive tree is holy, so are the branches. Now the root is going to represent Judaism, and the branches are going to represent the individuals who are a part of Judaism. Uh, but if some of the branches were broken off, so 
of that wild olive tree of, uh, I'm sorry, the of, of that cultivated olive tree of Judaism, some branches were broken off. Uh, what branches would that be? It would be the uh, Pharisee-oriented Jewish people, and it would be the Sadducee-oriented Jewish people who rejected Yeshua uh, as the Messiah. So they are broken off of the cultivated olive tree of Judaism because of their unbelief and, um, and um, uh, rejection of Yeshua. The branches that are left on would be the believers in Yeshua from um, from Judaism. So Jewish people who believed in Yeshua are left in the tree of Judaism. The unbelieving branches are broken off and uh, cast aside, and that would be the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees. Uh, so some of the branches are broken off, and you a wild olive, and I'm going to add the word branch here, a wild olive branch, so the other olive tree that uh, Paul is talking about, which he calls a wild olive tree, is the olive tree of Gentileism, I guess you'd call it. And if you are a branch of the wild olive tree of Gentileism, but you believe in Yeshua, what happens to you? You were grafted in among them, that is grafted in to the uh, good olive tree, the cultivated olive tree of, uh, of Judaism. So you, a Gentile, are becoming uh, a Jew. It's not the other, it's not the other way around. Um, and, and you'll notice that um, uh, even the unbelieving branches of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were broken off, but they weren't grafted into the Gentile uh, olive tree. Uh, they were just cast aside uh, uh, for judgment, uh, basically. So the direction here is one way. Um, it is uh, branches of the cultivated olive tree remaining in the tree, Jews remaining Jews when they believe in Yeshua, uh, and Gentiles who believe in Yeshua being grafted into the uh, olive tree of, uh, uh, of, Ju of Judaism. So it's one direction. Anybody, when Gentiles become believers in Yeshua, they are grafted into Judaism, which includes those original branches that were not broken off and the Gentile branches that have been grafted in. And that is perfectly consistent with Galatians 3 here. So you were grafted in among them and have become equal sharers in the rich root of the olive tree. That's the olive tree of Judaism. Uh, now there's a warning then don't boast as if you were better than the branches, the branches that were broken off. However, if you do boast, remember that you are not supporting the root. The root is Judaism. The root, Judaism, is supporting you. So you will say, ah, br branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true, but so what? They were broken off because of their lack of trust. Another way of saying lack of trust is unbelief, rejection of Yeshua. However, you keep your place only because of your trust. So don't be arrogant. On the contrary, be terrified. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he certainly won't spare you. So take a look at God's kindness and his severity. On the one hand, severity toward those who fell off. But on the other hand, God's kindness toward you, provided you maintain yourself in that kindness. Otherwise, you'll be cut off too. So Gentile branches that have been grafted in can be cut off due to uh, unbelief. Moreover, the others, those that have been cut off, those branches that have been cut off and cast aside, if they do not persist in their lack of trust, will be grafted in. So a Jewish branch that comes to faith can be grafted back in, and that's the Messianic Jewish movement of today, uh, because God is able to graft them back in. For if you were cut out of what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree of Judaism, how much more will those natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? I want to talk a little bit about Gentile converts, just very briefly, to Judaism throughout the biblical uh, period. 
before the uh, appearance on the historical scene of the sects of Judaism, Sadducees, Pharisees, and Nazarene Essenes. So before, um, we'll say 175 uh, BC, BCE, if you prefer. Uh, there was only one uh, sect or one denomination of Juda uh, Judaism. It wasn't uh, divided into these three different uh, groups. So uh, when a Gentile wanted to uh, 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 became a believer in the promises of the Messiah, remember he wasn't on the historical scene yet, uh, when Gentiles became believers in those promises, uh, they could be born again, just like the heroes of faith from uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, so what would usually happen is that some leader in Judaism, a priest uh, or a prophet, um, in later times, a rabbi or a kind of a local synagogue leader, uh, would take that potential Gentile convert uh, under his wing and teach him the Tanakh, uh, teach him the Bible. And he would get all the laws and stuff, and he would get all of the um, uh, promises uh, as well. Now, keep in mind that for a Gentile, the Tanakh did not apply. The Old Testament did not apply. They were still operating by conscience, um, but Jews had been given the Tanakh. So if he became a convert to Judaism, he was going to have to embrace the Tanakh, and the Tanakh, the law of Moses, would have authority over him. So he would study with this uh, leader, and uh, at the end of his uh, period of study, if he decided that, yes, he did want to become uh, a Jewish person, he, he wanted to join Judaism, uh, then if he was a male, he would have to be circumcised. Um, and as an adult, that was serious business. Uh, women, of course, were exempt from that requirement because I don't think it can, can be done. Uh, and then uh, he would also have to be a baptized, which was a ceremonial washing. So he would uh, kind of ceremonially wash all the uh, sinful Gentile stuff off of him and then he would join uh, Judaism. And when he did, he was Jewish, and God did not distinguish, um, uh, you know, did not, um, um, was not, um, uh, didn't look down his nose at him because he was from a Gentile background. Uh, once he converted, uh, he was fully Jewish, and he had all the rights and privileges, all the inheritance, um, as Paul puts it here, equal sharers in the uh, rich root of the olive tree. So uh, yeah, he, be he became Jewish. And um, uh, so um, uh, when the um, sects did uh, emerge on the scene, then Gentiles who wanted to become Jewish had to decide which sect they wanted to convert to. And uh, because the Sadducees were the priestly party, and that depended on their uh, genealogy. It depended on the bloodline of um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, through Levi and through uh, Aaron for uh, many of them. Uh, Gentile converts really were not welcome uh, uh, among the, the Sadducees. There may have been some exceptions to that. Uh, but then uh, also if uh, they wanted to convert to Judaism and be like the Pharisees, then the same process would take place. So some leader among the Pharisees would take this potential convert under his wing, teach him the Bible, circumcise him, and baptize him, and then he would become not just Jewish, but a Pharisee. He would become a Pharisee. The Nazarenes and Essenes did the same thing. Uh, uh, Gentiles who wanted to convert to uh, Essenism or Nazareneism. Uh, would uh, find a uh, leader of, of that sect, and uh, he would uh, teach them, um, baptize them, and circumcise them, and that they would be Jewish, but specifically they would be Nazarenes, or they would be uh, Essenes. And that was the situation that was going on when um, uh, Yeshua was uh, living his life and doing his ministry. There were three prominent sects, Yeshua was of the Nazarene sect, so his disciples became Nazarene Jews. The disciples of the Pharisees became Pharisees, so Judaism was divided at that point, 
And uh, after the days of Jesus, basically, uh, the, the, um, uh, the Sadducees kind of disappeared from the scene because their temple was destroyed in 70 AD, shortly after the, uh, the period of uh, Jesus' life and ministry. And because there was no use for them, they just disappeared. You know, I suppose uh, most of them probably became Pharisees. Unless they believed in Yeshua, then they would become Nazarenes or uh, Essenes. Many of the uh, Essenes were of the priestly party, too. So uh, converts after that time would join one of the sects or the others. And the main distinguishing characteristic between the Pharisees and the uh, Nazarene Essenes was faith in Yeshua. So uh, the Pharisees um, were hostile to Yeshua, had rejected him. And in fact, uh, in um, I think it was 90 AD at the uh, Council of Yavnia, they changed their religion. They changed their belief in the Trinity because that was so prominent among the, um, uh, the Nazarenes. Uh, they, uh, they changed um, uh, some of their doctrines to distinguish them from the Nazarenes. So uh, people who wanted to become Jewish but didn't believe in Yeshua or didn't want to uh, converted to Phariseeism. And Phariseeism has survived to this day as um, what's now called Talmudic or Rabbinic Judaism. It is non-believing in Yeshua Judaism. The other Judaism that is, is on the scene today uh, has taken uh, the, uh, ha had its beginnings with the Nazarene Essenes, very successfully recruited a lot of Gentiles <laughs> into the family of faith, um, but lost the Jewish characteristic and identity of the church when the Gentiles just overwhelmed the Jews in numbers uh, in the church. I'm told that throughout uh, Christian history, there has always been a remnant of Jewish people in, in the church, and I've seen some evidence for that. But the, um, uh, the, the uh, predominant uh, ethnic uh, identity in the Christian church for the longest time, for centuries, for uh, over a millennium, uh, ha has, has been uh, Gentile. And so uh, when uh, Gentile, uh, non-believing Gentiles uh, believe uh, in Yeshua in most places, uh, they don't understand that they're becoming uh, Jewish, that they're being grafted into this uh, cultivated olive tree. Um, uh, rather, they think they're, they're joining Gentile Christianity as opposed to Jewish Phariseeism, rabbinic Judaism. Uh, but, but what is uh, actually happening is that all those people who think they're joining a Gentile church are actually, from God's perspective, being grafted into the, the cultivated, believing tree of Judaism. So the Nazarene Christian church is like a remnant of the largest segment of the Jewish people who have uh, accepted Yeshua as the Messiah and, uh, you know, have, uh, have carried on. So Christianity has always been what I would call true Judaism, believing Judaism. Um, the, um, uh, let me just talk briefly about uh, who is a Jew uh, these days, because it's confusing. Throughout the biblical era, genealogies were traced through the man, through the father, uh, from generation to generation. All the genealogies in the Bible uh, include men's names, except when a prominent woman is associated with that man who is a, uh, a father. So Judaism was passed from father to son, to father to son, to father to son, through the, the uh, ages. At some point in the history of Judaism, and now I'm talking about Pharisaic Judaism, non-Messianic, non-believing Judaism. That changed. And uh, uh, at some point, uh, Judaism was passed on to the next generation through the mother. So that uh, nowadays, if you have a Jewish mother, then uh, her children are ethnic, uh, ethnic Jews. Uh, if, um, uh, if the um, father of the couple, of the married couple, is Jewish, but he marries a Gentile woman, then the Gentile woman's children are considered Gentile. 
and they must convert to Judaism, even though their dad is uh, is Jewish. So the Jewishness is passed nowadays through through the woman. So let me use my family as an example. My mother's father, my maternal grandfather, was Jewish. Uh, his um, Hebrew name, last name was Shafir. And uh, he married a Gentile woman. And uh, that Gentile woman and uh, my Jewish grandfather gave birth to my mom. Uh, but because her mother, was, the Gentile woman was a Christian. And so my mom was born of a Jewish father and a Gentile mother. So she would not be considered Jewish. If she had converted to Judaism, and, and in many Jewish families, that's the way it works. Uh, if she had converted to Judaism, then when I was born, I would have been considered Jewish, no matter who the father was. Uh, my dad was a Gentile. He was a, a Christian also. Uh, so I would have been born Jewish. So Judaism would have considered me to be a uh, Jew, ethnically a Jew, with the blood of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob running through me, even though uh, my mother had been considered a Gentile by them, and uh, uh, her mother was, was considered a Gentile. But if my mother had converted to Judaism, then even though she was considered a Gentile convert, then when I was born, I would have been considered Jewish. So I guess according to the biblical paradigm, uh, my mom was Jewish and I'm Jewish. According to the modern day Pharisaical rabbinic Judaism paradigm, uh, my mom was not Jewish because she was born Gentile and didn't convert. And because she was a Gentile, she gave birth to me, a Gentile child, and uh, I didn't convert, although I've kind of converted because I believe in Yeshua. So I, as a, as a Gentile believer, my faith in Yeshua grafts me from the Gentile olive tree into the cultivated olive tree of Judaism. That's all the time I'm going to be able to spend on this. Um, uh, I highly recommend a book called Converts in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is Carmen Palmer's doctoral dissertation. And uh, it's kind of hard to read here, but the subtitle is The Gair or the uh, Gentile Convert and Mutable Ethnicity. She goes through the Dead Sea Scrolls and makes a very convincing case that when Gentiles converted to Judaism, they not only joined the religion, but their ethnicity changed. They became ethnic Jews, which really, as we've just described uh, the paradigm for uh, rabbinic uh, Pharisaic Judaism, uh, they, would have to, uh, they would have to acknowledge that. Um, so uh, she makes a very good case that uh, when Gentiles convert, they become fully Jewish, uh, not only religiously, but also, also ethnically and culturally, they will inherit all the promises, including real estate in the promised land, uh, um, when the kingdom comes, when the millennium comes. It's a great book, and, and I used it for my research in, in one of my books, but you pay over $100 for this book, so take my word for it. It's a great book. Uh, I would also recommend my uh, first book, Yeshua, He Will Be Called a Nazarene, because I discuss the relationship between Jews and Gentiles in that book. And then I've also written a uh, commentary on the Epistle to the Romans by Paul, an apostle of Yeshua and the Nazarene. And uh, I go into depth in uh, Romans chapters uh, 9 through 11 to talk about that relationship between Jews and Gentiles. So let me leave this subject by just saying, all you Gentiles who have become believers in Yeshua and been born again, you're Jewish, whether you like it or not. You've been grafted into the tree. Okay, let's turn our attention now to the uh, work of the Holy Spirit, particularly his descent on the day of Pentecost and kind of the birth of the, uh, of the Christian church. Um, first of all, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to start in John 14. This is part of the teaching of Jesus on the night of the Last Supper. So this is the evening before he died on the cross. It's his, 
his very last teaching uh, with his disciples. And he's talking about the fact that he's about to uh, leave the earth and return to heaven where he came from, but he promises them that he will send them the Holy Spirit to uh, kind of take up where he left off. And he says, the world cannot receive him. The him is a reference to the Holy Spirit because it neither sees nor knows him, but you know him because he is now with you and will be in you. So what he's saying about the world of people, the unbelieving world of people, is that the Holy Spirit is with them. He surrounds them. He's influencing them from the outside. He's trying to get inside so they can believe in the gospel and be born again and uh, be grafted into the uh, believing tree of uh, Judaism, become Nazarene uh, Christians. Uh, but they, they neither see him nor know him. So he's there working and they are just oblivious to it. Interestingly, the same thing is true of the disciples. He says he is now with you, but he will be in you. So their relationship with the Holy Spirit was about to change until the Spirit gets inside you and plants those seeds of faith and produces a new birth. Uh, through faith in Yeshua, and you're, you're born again, um, your relationship with him is just going to be kind of a, I'll call it a distant one, uh, an incomplete one. Well, after his death on the cross and his resurrection, he meets with the disciples in John 20 on the first evening of the resurrection, the first day of the resurrection. And he says to them, Shalom Aleichem. Anybody know what that means? Uh, peace to you all. Uh, Yeshua repeated, uh, just as the Father sent me, I myself am also sending you. So as the Father equipped Yeshua to do ministry, he was going to equip them, his disciples, to do ministry. Having said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Ruach HaKodesh. I think we've talked about the, Holy, uh, the Ruach HaKodesh previously. That's the Hebrew term for the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Kind of reminiscent of the creation of Adam. Uh, God uh, forms and shapes the body of Adam out of the dust of the earth, and then he breathes into him the breath of life. He infuses him uh, with spiritual and soulish life. Uh, Jesus is doing the same thing here for his disciples in a spiritual manner. He is breathing the Holy Spirit into them. This is where the Spirit transitioned from being with them to in them. I believe this is where they were born again. Uh, this is where they began, became new, uh, a new creation. Uh, this is where it was determined that they would remain grafted in, or not grafted in, but uh, remain in, um, abiding in the, um, the cultivated olive tree of Judaism and not be, um, you know, uh, cut off and, and cast away in, in judgment. So here's where they become believers. Now, I must say that before this time, they had gone out on mission trips and worked miracles in the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua. And that is just using the authority of the name of Yeshua to produce results, and anybody can do it. I once saw a video of a, a Christian street minister uh, who um, wanted to heal a person, and he used a girl who was a Satanist, a worshiper of Satan, and told her what to, uh, basically told her, if you want to see your friend get healed, here's what I want you to say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And this Satan worshiper said, in the name of Jesus, be healed, and the gal was healed. So anybody can use the name of Jesus to produce supernatural results. But if you want to be born again, if you want to be a new creation, then you have to have the Spirit in you. And that's where it happened. Uh, John 20 is where it happened for the disciples. It didn't happen to Thomas until the, because Thomas was absent from that meeting. So he didn't have this experience until a week later. And all the time of, uh, while he was waiting during that week, yeah, he got the nickname Doubting Thomas, you know, until I see the evidence, I'm not going to believe. Um, so, uh, but, but he was born again the next week. Then in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, 
um, uh, Jesus w uh, got together with his disciples before he ascended into heaven, and he taught them and prepared them for what was to come. At one of those gatherings, he, Yeshua, instructed them not to leave Jerusalem. remember that's the Hebrew name of Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father promised, which you heard about from me. For Yohanan used to immerse people in water, but in a few, uh, baptize people in water. But in a few days, you will be immersed in the Ruach HaKodesh, baptized in the Holy Spirit. So there is an experience of the Holy Spirit that is still future with these disciples who have just been uh, born again. So there are, I guess, three phases of uh, our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Verse 6. When they were together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore self-rule to Israel? In other words, is the millennial kingdom coming? Uh, are you going to be returning soon to, to rule uh, for a thousand years? He answered, you don't need to know the dates or times the Father has kept. Uh, the Father has kept these under his own authority. Um, he doesn't have to tell you, and he's chosen not to tell you. But you will receive power when the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses, both in Yerushalayim, here in the capital city, in all Yehuda, which was the tribal territory that surrounded uh, uh, Jerusalem, and Shomron, that's uh, uh, Samaria, up north, um, the Samaritans were kind of half Jew, half Gentile, so that's the beginning of uh, opening up the uh, gospel and the, uh, and the church uh, to uh, Gentiles, uh, indeed to the ends of the earth. So go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Uh, then on Acts chapter 2, we have uh, just the beginning of the narrative of the uh, day of uh, Pentecost, the festival of Shavuot. Um, uh, Shavuot is a Hebrew word that means uh, sevens. Um, they were supposed to count uh, seven weeks uh, of uh, days, so it would be uh, seven weeks, and then add a week, uh, add a day. So on the 50th day, the Feast of Pentecost, which is a Greek word, or Shavuot, uh, which means sevens, uh, Feast of Pentecost arrived, and the believers were gathered together in one place. I think the temple courts, not the upper room. Uh, but there are differences of opinion on that. Suddenly there came a sound from the sky like the roar of a violent wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Guess who that was? Right, it was the Ruach HaKodesh. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire. So this is a visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit, which separated and came to rest on each of them. I can just picture them with little flames over their uh, heads, uh, Spirit is manifesting his presence in a way that they can see with their eyes. They were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh and began to talk in other in different languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. I will say briefly that in John chapter 4, Jesus had a conversation with a Samaritan woman, and there he explained to her that he was giving out living water, which was a symbol of the Holy Spirit, which you drink in and which wells up inside you and produces eternal life. So that's the spirit going from being with you to in you. But later in John uh, 7, at a, um, uh, one of the feasts uh, in, um, um, in, in Jerusalem, Jesus was there and he preached to the crowds. And he said, uh, anyone who's thirsty, come to me and drink. And uh, rivers of living water will flow out from him. So the rivers of living water are what you drink in and produce the new birth, uh, new spiritual life. But then when those rivers of living water flow out of you, that is the power of the Holy Spirit coming out from your body where you've received the Holy Spirit and impacting other people to do uh, supernatural and miraculous things. And that happened for them on the first day of Pentecost there, and it kept happening in every community that they went out to uh, reach uh, after that. So that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how he appeared on the day of Pentecost uh, to give those disciples the same power source that Jesus had had during his ministry and by which he did his miracles. One of the things that Jesus said in John 14 was, whoever believes in me will do the things that I've been doing and even greater things than these. 
that would be an unreasonable, impossible prediction and expectation if Yeshua had not given them the Holy Spirit. So he did his works by the Holy Spirit, then gave them the Holy Spirit so they could do them too. And the book of Acts of the Apostles is full of miracles that these mere mortals uh, who believed in Yeshua and had the Holy Spirit, uh, had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, did. So we've talked about the day of Pentecost, kind of the, the beginning of the charismatic church, the power of the Holy Spirit-filled uh, church. And uh, now we want to turn our attention to the apostolic period and take a brief look at the book of Acts. I'm going to do this with maps, because I think that's the best way in a rapid uh, manner uh, to talk about uh, the things that happened uh, in the book of Acts. After the day of Pentecost, the gospel began to spread just like in this, with, with the same, oh, what do you call it, itinerary that Jesus gave them. It's going to start in Jerusalem, and it did. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people became believers, and then added a few thousand uh, in the next few days when uh, Peter and John went to the temple and healed a crippled guy, and lots of people became believers. So, um, uh, I mean, people were joining the Christian church, the I should say the Nazarene Jewish Christian uh, church, uh, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, it just overnight, it went from being, a, you know, a group of uh, just, um, you know, a little over 100 people to being uh, a mega church. So that started in Jerusalem, and then the gospel begins to spread to the north. Uh, in Acts chapter 6, um, the church is becoming so big that they decide to add deacons or ministers. Diakonos means minister. Uh, to the church. So they pick, uh, what is it, six or seven um, uh, deacons that will serve under the leadership of the apostles. One of them is Stephen, who is martyred for his faith in Acts chapter seven, maybe eight, six, seven, and eight in that uh, territory. Uh, another one named Philip goes up into Samaria, remember, half Gentile, half Jew, preaches the gospel up there, and people believe. I think he was doing some miracles up there, uh, too, as I recall. And uh, people believe and join the church up there. Well, Peter and John, John in Jerusalem, hear about it. So they go up to visit this new Samaritan church plant, and they find it to be legitimate. So they want these people to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so they lay hands on them and pray for them. They receive the power of the Holy Spirit. They speak in tongues. They uh, do the uh, signs and wonders and stuff to confirm their faith. In the meantime, God is sending Philip from Samaria down on the road from Jerusalem that leads to Gaza. Now, here it points to Ashkelon because Philip didn't make it to, uh, didn't make it to Gaza. The road just heads in that direction. And uh, on the road uh, to uh, Gaza, he encounters this uh, Ethiopian, um, it was a eunuch, uh, a servant uh, uh, in the uh, noble court of Queen Candace of Ethiopia. And uh, he's been to Jerusalem, um, you know, probably for some uh, celebration. He's on his way back to Ethiopia. He's riding in a chariot. Uh, and uh, while he is um, riding along there, he is reading the book of Isaiah. And Philip encounters him, and he says, uh, hey, I see you're reading the book of Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading? And the guy goes, um, there's no way I can understand this stuff unless somebody explains it to me. And Philip goes, um, uh, I'm your man. I'm the guy who can explain it to you. I'm your huckleberry, as uh, Doc Holliday would say. So Philip climbs up on board the uh, chariot with him. And they go through the book of Isaiah. He happened to be reading in chapter 53, which is all about the atonement and the sacrifice of Christ and the resurrection and stuff. So Philip explains to the Ethiopian eunuch that it's talking about Jesus and it's actually happened in history. And, you know, uh, uh, his life has been changed because of it. The Ethiopian eunuch believes he wants to be baptized. Philip baptizes him. And when they come up out of the water, God raptures 
uh, of Philip, and and I'm I'm not using that in a garden term. Uh, the term is harpazo, which is the uh, Greek term for the for rapture, like to be caught up in the air. So uh, you know, the Bible says Philip disappeared, and the Enoch didn't Enoch didn't see him anymore, but he's been born again. He's got eternal life, so he goes on his way celebrating. And, uh, you know, Philip uh, comes down in Azotus, uh, comes in for a landing in Azotus, and he preaches the gospel in a couple of places, and he ends up here in Caesarea, uh, where he raises a family, and I believe some of his daughters become uh, prophetesses. So uh, also, uh, Peter is uh, busy. He travels from Jerusalem out here to Lydda, where he raises a man named Aeneas. Uh, or he heals a man named uh, Aeneas. Uh, so Peter's doing miracles too. Um, after that, he goes out here to uh, Yafo or Joppa, and he stays with a uh, tanner, a guy who's in the uh, leather processing business out there for a while. The guy's name is Simon. He stays with him for a while until he uh, is paid a visit by uh, a group of um, uh, travelers, I guess you would say, from the household of Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion living in Caesarea, who is um, very interested in becoming a believer in uh, Yeshua. He kind of believes in him anyway. He, want, you know, like he, wa he wants to be, he wants the full package. So he sends messengers down here to uh, Yafo for uh, Peter. Uh, Peter goes, man, if somebody wants to hear the gospel, I'll go share it. So he goes up here to Caesarea, shares the gospel, and that man and his whole family become believers. They're baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit. They um, uh, speak in tongues and, and do all the signs and wonders and, and stuff like that. But all the time that that's going on among the Nazarene Jews, which becomes the Christian church, there's also a prominent individual named Saul of Tarsus, who is a Pharisee. And he's persecuting the church here. Uh, he, his headquarters, uh, his base of operations is in uh, Jerusalem. He's going around Jerusalem, rounding up Christians, rind, winding, uh, rounding up believers in Yeshua, Nazarenes, Nazarene Essenes, bringing them to trial and even putting some of them to death. Uh, Saul of Tarsus, who later becomes Paul the Apostle, uh, I guess that's a... Um, uh, that's kind of a giveaway of the uh, what, what's coming in the future, um, uh, putting them in prison, and, and he even contributed in a big way. He was probably the main accuser of Stephen when Stephen was stoned to death because of his faith in uh, Yeshua. So Paul's persecuting the church in Jerusalem. He kind of gets kind of bored with that, and he asks the chief priests for uh, like letters of, of what? Uh, authority letters. Uh, to go up to Damascus and to find believers in Yeshua there and persecute them there. So he's on the way to Damascus to do that when he encounters the risen Lord Jesus Christ and his name, uh, his life was never the same after that. So he's converted there in Damascus and he's converted to such a degree. This guy was a preacher already. He was a, a, a preacher of Pharisaic Judaism. So he knows how to preach. Now he's become a believer in Yeshua. So now he is a member of Nazarene Judaism. So he starts preaching Yeshua and he's making converts and it's very powerful and very effective. And it really irritates all the Pharisaic Jews uh, in uh, Damascus. So they try to kill him. So he escapes. He goes out here to Arabia. And I think he spends about three years in Arabia spending more time with the risen Yeshua, learning about the gospel, learning about the New Testament, straight from the horse's mouth, I, I guess you could say. So he learns the gospel from Yeshua, same way the other uh, apostles learned it from uh, Yeshua. How long did it take them? Three and a half years. How long did it take Paul? Three years. So uh, he, he was uh, smart enough to do the short course he goes to, back to Damascus, and they try to kill him again. So he goes down to Jerusalem and introduces himself to the, uh, to the Christians there, the Nazarene Jews uh, there. And uh, they give him uh, kind of a hesitant welcome. Some of them are scared to death of him because he's been persecuting them. Uh, 
Uh, but he gets in good with um, James, and I think he meets with Peter also. But uh, his best friend uh, from among the believers is Barnabas. So uh, Barnabas kind of shows him around and everything, and um, eventually he wears out his welcome in uh, Jerusalem, and the Pharisaic Jews try to kill him there. So he escapes from Judaism and goes up to his hometown of Tarsus, in uh, Asia Minor, in modern-day Turkey, and he stays there for a while. And Barnabas goes back to work, and uh, uh, there's this um, uh, Christian church that has started in Antioch of Syria. Uh, Barnabas uh, checks that out and thinks this place is ideal for Paul, or uh, for Saul. So he goes to Tarsus, gets Saul, brings him back to Antioch, and he and Barnabas start a uh, very uh, prosperous uh, Nazarene Jewish Christian, Messianic Jewish congregation uh, there. Um, uh, uh, Paul is not content with just this uh, small-scale ministry, so he and Barnabas, his buddy, uh, team up to go on the first missionary journey. So they leave from Antioch, their home congregation. Uh, they sail to Cyprus, do ministry there, leave from there, go up to uh, Asia Minor, the Galatian region. This is southern Galatia. And they plant four churches there, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. And uh, when Paul later writes the letter to the Galatians, it's a letter written to these four, uh, four congregations. And um, uh, you can see Galatia's up here, the green section, and the green section extends down to where those four churches are. So they are the Galatian churches. Some people call it the Southern Galatian churches. This ministry was very successful, but it was not without difficulty. For example, when they got to Lystra, Paul made enough enemies from among the Pharisaic Jews that they stoned him. To, they thought to death here. Uh, took him outside the city and stoned him, and they thought he was dead. And either he was, and God raised him back to life, or, um, you know, the, the Christians prayed for him, and his, his injuries were healed, at least partially, so that he was able to continue. He went to Derby. And uh, even though he had been persecuted in all these other um, cities by the Pharisaic Jews, he, he and Barnabas went back the same way and visited all those churches where they'd been persecuted. And then they returned to Antioch, and a short time later, they started their second missionary journey, this time uh, also from Antioch. But there was a little disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, because on the first missionary journey, they had taken along a guy named John Mark. This is the Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. And Mark got as far as Pamphylia here, and he bailed out. He went back home to Jerusalem. The uh, Bible doesn't tell us what the reason was, but he left the missionary team there. And Paul was bothered by that. And since he bailed out on him once, Paul did not want to, uh, I sh should be calling him Saul. Well, once he becomes a believer, he becomes the Apostle Paul. So now I can refer to him as Paul. So uh, when uh, their second missionary journey is going to begin, Barnabas wants to take Mark along, if for no other reason than that Mark is a relative of Barnabas's. So, uh, you know, he wants to treat his family member right. So uh, he wants to take him along. Paul doesn't want to take him along. So they agree. Paul and Barnabas agree to split. Uh, so, um, um, Barnabas takes Mark and they go back to Cyprus. Uh, Paul and his new companion, Silas, decide to go up over land through Turkey, through Asia Minor. And uh, they visit these four churches again, just to encourage them and see how things are going. And then, uh, you know, they want to go down uh, in this direction, uh, and they want to go up in this direction, but the Holy Spirit keeps saying no. Uh, so the Holy Spirit is definitely at the controls, and he guides them down to Troas, that's ancient Troy. And uh, while they're staying there, um, Paul has a dream or a vision uh, about a guy from Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. And so uh, they decide that that's the Holy Spirit uh, telling them uh, where he wants them to go. So they head that way. They go into Macedonia. They plant churches in Philippi. Uh, let's see, Thessalonica, First and Second Thessalonians. They go to Berea. There's not a book of the Bereans, 
but the Bereans are uh, a, a great Christian uh, group. Uh, Paul heads down to Athens. Not very successful there. There's no church planted in Athens. It's probably too pagan uh, there. And then he goes to Corinth and, uh, and plants a church there. The Church of the Corinthians is the uh, church that's uh, known for spiritual gifts and supernatural experiences and things like that, but also for some of the challenges that they were facing, particularly the immorality that was going on in the church. So it was a church with a lot of problems, but it was a power church. The Holy Spirit was very prominent there. So uh, he leaves there, touches base briefly in Ephesus, but then he heads back to Jerusalem for one of the feasts, uh, and then he heads back up to his uh, home uh, congregation at uh, Antioch. So that's the first and second missionary uh, journeys of uh, Paul. Uh, he starts out again on his um, third missionary journey and goes overland once again through the four Galatian churches, but he heads right for Ephesus, where he had briefly touched base before. And he does ministry there. I think he's there about three years in uh, Ephesus. He makes some disciples there, plants a church, gets it going uh, really well. Uh, he kind of took over for a guy named uh, Apollos, who was a disciple of John the Baptist. So um, Paul kind of brings him up to speed and gets the church going there. But while he's there, he finds out about some uh, uh, pretty serious things that are going on in the church at Corinth. So he pays him a quick visit. He writes him a letter there. Uh, it's kind of a strict uh, letter. He's worried that uh, maybe they don't like him anymore in Corinth, and maybe he's lost his uh, leadership uh, authority there. So uh, he does a lot of worrying. He does a lot of praying. Eventually, he heads for Corinth over land, and uh, somewhere probably at uh, Philippi, uh, he writes 2 Corinthians. Uh, so he writes two letters to the Corinthians. And here's where he finds out that they still love him. Uh, they've taken all the advice that he's given them. And so he rejoices over that. And he heads down uh, that way and visit with, visits with the Corinthians again and really encourages them and a uh, great relationship there. And then he heads back uh, kind of overland and oversee uh, to go to uh, Jerusalem. But all along the way here, there are people and the Holy Spirit telling him, if you go to Jerusalem, um, you're going to run into problems there. You're going to be persecuted there. You're going to be arrested there. Um, and all of his friends are encouraging him not to go. The Holy Spirit, too, is warning him that all these things are going to happen. So these prophecies that were uttered are legitimate prophecies. The Holy Spirit is not trying to prevent him from going to Jerusalem but just warning him what awaits him if he does uh, go there. So, uh, you know, I don't know if God's will was for him to go to Jerusalem or not. I think it probably was, and I think he, Paul discerned that. So he goes to Jerusalem, and sure enough, he gets arrested in the temple. And the Pharisaic Jews there, the non-believing non in Yeshua Jews, um, arrest him in the temple, and they're going to beat him to death. But the Romans, uh, the Roman uh, garrison that's there in Jerusalem, they rescue him. And uh, so uh, they throw him in their own prison just to protect him from, from his Jewish persecutors. And um, so uh, Paul happens to be a Roman citizen. And he makes use of the right that every uh, Roman citizen has to appeal his case the case that's been made against him by these Pharisaic Jews, uh, appeal it to Caesar. Uh, every, uh, every Roman citizen had that right. So I think maybe Paul sees this as his ticket to Rome. So he wants to preach the gospel to Caesar and to the, you know, the people who live in Italy and, and in Rome. So um, the Roman uh, uh, garrison there, the Roman leadership, uh, they have to honor that. So um, uh, they escort him to protect him up to, um, uh, Caesar, uh, up to Caesarea on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. He's there for a couple of years, uh, kind of uh, languishing away in prison there. Uh, but eventually, the, um, uh, the Jewish leadership and the Roman leadership decide to uh, put him on a ship to send him to Rome 
so that he can um, so that he can appeal his case to Caesar. So they put him on a ship, and he this is the course that they travel. Uh, Paul was hoping that they would spend the winter in um, Crete because the weather was bad. Uh, but um, for whatever reason, they left on a uh, to complete their trip and ran into just a horrendous storm. Look, look at the arrows here about how hard the wind was blowing and stuff. And the sea, uh, the uh, ship was really in jeopardy. And uh, eventually the storm just blew it to Malta and it kind of crashed on the rocks there. But, er but everybody survived. God had promised Paul that he would uh, survive the trip and, and get to go to Rome. And he did. Here's the path of Paul going up to Rome. And uh, he lived in kind of um, uh, house custody, I guess you would call it. He had a rented place. A Roman soldier stayed with him. And you better believe that Roman soldier heard the gospel uh, now and then. And uh, so he spent some time there in Rome. And uh, tradition tells us, the Bible doesn't tell us, but tradition tells us um, that he presented his case before a Nero, who was a terrible a tyrant of an emperor. And uh, Nero dismissed the charges against him and set him free. He may have continued uh, another missionary journey or missionary work somewhere, but um, uh, the book of Acts doesn't tell us about that. The book of Acts ends here with Paul in Rome. So that's kind of the book of Acts. Uh, we want to move on from the apostolic period to the succeeding or the uh, following uh, periods of church history. There's the period of the early church fathers, uh, the period of Constantine embracing Christianity, the Dark Ages, the Reformation era that a lot of us are familiar with, the period of worldwide evangelism, and then the period of the last days. And here's the rapture. So um, uh, this is the way history has played out right up to the uh, period of worldwide evangelism, and I think that period has come to an end. Uh, everybody's familiar with Billy Graham. He's probably the most prominent uh, person in this, uh, uh, in this period of time, and he died recently, and there's nobody on the scene to replace him. So I think this is over with, and we may be moving into the last days. Now, nobody knows the day or the hour, uh, but I think we, we may be entering the last days. And I believe that uh, Dr. Ede uh, also um, uh, um, believed that this succession of eras is also played out in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, where uh, Jesus basically uh, dictates letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. So I've got my map here of the seven churches in Asia Minor, uh, to whom, to these churches, uh, were addressed those uh, seven letters. Now, we're not going to read through all seven letters, but one of the things that I want to emphasize is that there were actual churches in all of these cities at that time. And the good things and the bad things that Jesus said applied to those churches, but they also applied to all the churches, not only these seven, but the churches everywhere, in Greece, in Syria, in Turkey, uh, wherever there were churches, the principles applied. But each one of these congregations had kind of unique characteristics, some good and some bad, and Yeshua addresses those. Now, there's also another application between just the local application and the universal Christian application. There's the individual application, because a lot of these characteristics of the churches were individual characteristics of individual Christians, members of the churches. So there's a personal application. And then there's the controversial interpretation uh, or application, and that is that each one of these churches represents a historical period of the Christian church um, that covers the whole period of the church ending with, with the last days. So um, I, I believe that is the case. If these, these churches could have been arranged in any order, uh, but in the order that they are arranged, each one of the characteristics fits with these succeeding eras 
of, um, of church history. So let's start with Ephesus. That would represent the apostolic period. It had strengths and weaknesses. After that, there's the letter to the church at Smyrna. This is the early church fathers. And one of the characteristics of this period of time was that the church was uh, brutally persecuted for about 200 years. So in the first century, as I've already discussed um, in material that's in the book of Acts, the Nazarene Jews, Christians, were persecuted by the Pharisaic Jews. So all the persecution was coming from Jewish people. But in the second century, it started coming from the Romans, from the Gentiles. So um, the, um, uh, the Christians were persecuted by Gentiles, but the Jews were persecuted worse than that. So uh, the Jews were in no position to persecute anybody uh, after that, and neither were the Christians. So for 200 years, you got the persecuted church. That's the early church of fathers a time of great suffering by the church, but a time of great growth. When the church is persecuted, it grows like a, um, better than when things are going good for the church. So then we come to the church at Pergamum. One of the things I want to tell you about Pergamum is, I think I mentioned this briefly, when we were back in the Genesis uh, time frame, I talked about, to you about Nimrod and the satanic religion that he began in Babylon, in the city of Babylon in the Babylonian Empire. And uh, that satanic church was uh, at um, Babylon uh, until uh, one of the um, um, uh, imperial uh, conquests uh, and uh, Nimrod's satanic church left Babylon and moved to Pergamum. Um, and uh, like when that happened, uh, they got in good with Rome. So at the time of the book of Revelation, the, the satanic church of Nimrod is located in Pergamum. And Jesus even makes reference to that in the letter to uh, the church at Pergamos. Uh, he says, I know the seat of, or the throne of Satan, the synagogue of Satan is there in your city. Um, so this, so Pergamum represented uh, the church uh, that, resulted as a result of Emperor Constantine embracing Christianity. I think that happened early in the uh, 300s. I think it was 312 or something like that. The emperor becomes a Christian, and so everybody in the empire automatically becomes a Christian. Now, one good thing happened uh, because of that, and that was that um, the Christians stopped being persecuted. Uh, the emperor was a Christian, so who's going <laughs> to who's going to persecute the Christians? So persecution stops, but worldliness continues. Now, this Greek name Pergamum uh, means in Greek a mixed marriage or an inappropriate uh, marriage, and it was the marriage of church of of the church with the world. So persecution stops, and a lot of worldly people are just like. Um, what, by fiat, just they become Christians. They don't have to believe in Yeshua or anything. They're born in the empire, so they're Christians. So the world is mingled with the, um, you know, with the spiritual, with the uh, godly. And so it's a mess. And that leads to the church at uh, Thyatira. That's the Dark Ages. And that is where the Roman Catholic Church was really born. And we're starting in the fourth century, and uh, that's the time when a lot of Christian holidays were invented, like Christmas and Easter and Lent. Those are not biblical uh, holidays. Also, a lot of um, uh, kind of pagan-influenced behaviors uh, started uh, in the church, and I won't go into all those, but it basically resulted in uh, the Roman Catholic Church, with all of its mysteries and all of its superstitions and things like that. We go from the uh, birth and prominence of the uh, Roman Catholic Church in the Dark Ages to the letter to the church at Sardis, which represents the Reformation. Uh, here, Martin Luther is uh, depicted pounding the uh, 95 Theses on the uh, wooden door of the chapel at uh, Wittenberg, um, basically calling for reformation to uh, get people saved by grace through faith and uh, to orient 
the Christian religion around the Bible once again, instead of all these superstitious uh, pagan traditions and things like that. Uh, Luther was followed by uh, people like Calvin and Zwingli and uh, the um, more radical reformers. Reformation took place in all parts of uh, Europe. So you've got uh, Calvinists emerging from there and Arminians emerging from there. And uh, most of us who are belong to denominational churches, those churches were born in this era of the Reformation, the Church of Sardis. So most of us are kind of proud of our Christian heritage. The one thing that we need to keep in mind is when Jesus addresses the church at Sardis, the Reformation church, he does not have a good word to say about it. And I think maybe the reason for that is that the Reformation era churches did not reform enough. Uh, they reformed some important things, but not enough. We go from there to the church of Philadelphia, and that's the church that represents this period of worldwide evangelism. Uh, there have been some of what have been called great awakenings throughout the uh, history of our country. The first great awakening was taking place at about the time of the American Revolution. The second great awakening at the time of the American Civil War. And uh, there were revivals uh, all throughout that uh, period of time. Great, well-known evangelists that um, uh, preached the gospel in this country and around the world. And again, Billy Graham is the best known uh, of them. And a neat promise is given to the Church of Philadelphia or the Church of, of uh, Worldwide Evangelism. And again, this is meaningful to me because I have lived in the period of worldwide evangelism. Everything we've studied so far is of the past. This stuff is present Although it's like, like I say, if it's over with, it's a recent past. I have lived through this uh, period of time. And uh, I saw Billy Graham alive, and I saw that he died, and nobody has replaced him. But to this church, the Church of Philadelphia, uh, we read in Revelation 3, 7 through 11, to the angel of the Messianic community or the church in Philadelphia, right? Because you did obey my message about persevering. And man, the Great Awakening leadership, they certainly did obey the message about persevering. He said, I will keep you from the time of trial coming upon the whole world to put the people living on earth to the test. That is without doubt talking about the Great Tribulation. And what does Jesus say? I will keep you from the time. Uh, people who believe that the church goes through the tribulation, that the rapture happens at the second coming of Christ, and believers are going to go through the tribulation. They say what this means is that Jesus will keep you in the midst of the tribulation, like he'll protect you, but you'll have to go through it. That's not what this text says. It says, I will keep you from the time. Ek is the Greek word. It means out of or away from the time of trial. So the next phase we're going to go into is the Great Tribulation, and we'll learn why we don't want to why we don't want to go through it. And I think this promise gives us hope, and it may be an indication that the last days and the rapture are very near, because it's the Philadelphia Church that gets the promise. And then look, it looks like the time is short. Now nobody knows the day or the hour, including me, but I do believe this time has passed, and the next church. Uh, the last church is the church at Laodicea. This is the lukewarm church, neither hot nor cold. This is the church that Jesus said he's going to spew out of his mouth. But with that in mind, he also gives an invitation and hope. So to the angel of the church of the Messianic community or the church in Laodicea right here, I'm standing at the door knocking. If someone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. So Jesus has said, bad things are going to happen to you, but I'm knocking on the door of your heart. I want you to invite me to come into your life, uh, give you faith, give you the new birth, and get you out of the, uh, the, uh, the great uh, tribulation. If you don't, if you don't let me in, he says, then I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. So when the rapture happens, there will be some people who attend churches who are going to disappear. They're going to go up to heaven. There will be other churches who are going to come go to church the next Sunday. 
and find that the attendance is a lot smaller than it was the week before. But they have been spewed out of his mouth. And they, because, I mean, for all intents and purposes, they were unbelievers, they will go through the great tribulation. There will be um, uh, people in the great tribulation who come to faith uh, in Yeshua. Uh, and uh, they will go through uh, hard times. But at the time of the rapture, everybody who believes and has been born again uh, will will go up to uh, to heaven. Okay, let's continue uh, talking about this event, the rapture, the rapture of the church. Um, uh, Dr. Ede gives us 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, uh, 13 through uh, 18. Uh, for since we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, we also believe that in the same way, God, through Yeshua, will take with him those who have died. Now, when we die physically, our body is buried or disposed of in some appropriate manner, but our soul and spirit go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in a, some kind of a spiritual condition, with some kind of a spiritual body, they are with Yeshua in heaven, but they're awaiting the resurrection. So uh, this passage is saying that when Yeshua appears um, in the clouds, he will have the souls and spirits of those who have died with him. He will take them with him as he descends into the atmospheric heavens so that they can receive their resurrection bodies. There will be some people who are still alive that will just be transformed in an instant and kind of trade in their physical body for a eternal body, a resurrection body. So when we say this, we base it on the Lord's own word. We who, are, uh, who remain alive when the Lord comes will certainly not take precedence, precedence or go first or go before those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a rousing cry, uh, with a call from one of the ruling angels, and with God's shofar. Shofar is a Hebrew word that means a ram's horn. And I'm sure you've all heard uh, shofars sounding, uh, you know, the, the shofar trumpet uh, sounding. Uh, those who died united with Mashiach will be the first to rise. So the dead will rise first. Then we who are left alive, still uh, left still alive, will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will always be with the Lord. So encourage each other with these words. I've given you the Greek for the term "caught up." It's harpazo. It's harpazo in the Greek, and it means to be like snatched away, uh, just like Philip was. He was there on the road to Gaza, and then God snatched him up, put him down in Azotus. So uh, this is a catching up. Now, a lot of uh, critics of the rapture will say, uh, hey, I've looked in my Bible and the word rapture does not appear there even once. Well, guess what? The word Trinity doesn't appear there even once. So do you not believe in the Trinity? Um, uh, I'm, I'm going off the subject here. Uh, the word raptura is the Latin word that was used by uh, Jerome when he translated the Bible, Old and New Testaments, into the common Roman language of the time, which was the uh, Latin. So in the Latin Vulgate, instead of harpazo, it has the word raptura. And for centuries, Latin was the theological language of Christianity. So that's where the term rapture comes from, from the Latin for harpazo. Uh, but it means the same thing. It means being caught up, snatched up, caught away, uh, however you uh, want to say it. So yes, uh, rapture. Uh, is in the Bible. It's in the Latin Bible, but that's where the, the word comes from. The Greek word is harpazo, English word uh, caught up. Uh, Paul also writes about this subject in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse uh, 50. He says, let me, say, uh, let me say this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot share in the kingdom of God, nor can uh, something that decays share in what does not decay. So in other words, your earthly body, your flesh and blood body, uh, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Look, I tell you a secret, not all of us will die, but we will all be changed. It will take but a moment, the blink of an eye, at the final shofar, uh, trumpet, ram's horn trumpet. The shofar will sound and the dead will be raised to live forever, and we too will be changed. He's talking about the same thing he was talking about in um, 1 Thessalonians 4. 
For this material body, which can decay, must be clothed with uh, imperishability. Uh, this which is mortal must be clothed with immortality. When what decays puts on imperishability, and what is mortal puts on immortality, uh, then the passage in Tanakh, remember the Tanakh is an acronym for the Old Testament, the Torah, the Navi'im or the prophets, Torah is the law, Navi'im is the prophets, and the uh, K is for the Ketuvim or the holy writing, Psalms, Proverbs, and so on. So the whole Bible uh, talks about uh, this event. Uh, it will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is the sin, and sin draws its power from the Torah, the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. Now, we want to talk about the judgment seat of Christ, and this takes place in heaven for all these people who have been raptured off of the earth. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, our sins are judged um, uh, 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 I'm circling the rapture. I'm, that's not what I should be circling. Our sins are judged on the cross of Jesus Christ. He paid the full penalty. He said, it is finished. Tetelestai in uh, Greek. Uh, so our sins have been paid for, but this is not a judgment about sin. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Messiah that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So if we've done good, this is a judgment of works. So if we've done good things, uh, we, we get rewards uh, uh, for those good things we've done. If we've done bad things, we, um, we miss out. Uh, we probably don't get punished uh, for them. Maybe we do get punished. Uh, but this is, uh, this is not about salvation. It's about the works we have done once we've been saved. Uh, he talks about the same uh, subject in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Yeshua the Messiah. He's the foundation of the church, foundation of our lives. But we build upon that foundation with our works. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, that sounds like good works, doesn't it? Wood, hay, or straw sounds like not so good works. Each one work, one's works will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. So all of our works are going to pass through fire, either literally or symbolically and figuratively. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, on the foundation of Christ, um, uh, endures, then he will receive a reward. So those are the blessings that we get for doing good stuff. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So the judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment that determines whether you're saved or not. It uh, either blesses you for doing good works, or you just miss out if, uh, if you haven't done such a good works. <clears throat> Next, we'll want to talk about the marriage supper uh, of the Lamb. Uh, Revelation 19, then I heard what sounded like the roar of a huge crowd, like the sound of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, Adonai, that's Yahweh, uh, God of heaven's uh, armies has begun to reign. Uh, let us rejoice and be glad. Let us give him the glory for the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb and his bride has prepared herself. Fine linen, bright and clean, has been given to her to wear. Fine linen means the righteous deeds of God's people. And the angel said to me, right, how blessed are those who have been invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. So Yeshua is the bridegroom. Who's the bride? His church, the bride of Christ, the bride of Mashiach. So uh, there's a wedding ceremony that will take place uh, in heaven, and I think it takes place right at the end of the Great Tribulation, because um, some people are going to be raptured at the beginning uh, or before the Tribulation. They'll go through the judgment seat, and they will be available to attend the wedding supper, um, but all the believers, um, all those who become believers in the Great Tribulation will not. Now, there are a couple of companies of believers uh, that will be operating uh, prominently 
in the Great Tribulation. One is the 144,000. I think that's Revelation 7. They are 144,000 Jewish people uh, from the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each of the tribes. They are sealed by the Lord God with uh, his protection as they evangelize the world to the best of their ability during uh, tough times. And um, they're very effective. Um, multitudes of people become believers uh, through their ministry. And then, um, uh, so in chapter 7, they're here on the earth, and in chapter 14 of Revelation, they're up in heaven. So how did they get there? I think rapture. I think they get raptured. Maybe at the midpoint of the tribulation some other time, but the 40, 144,000 need to be in heaven before the marriage supper takes place. Uh, there are two other guys, uh, the two witnesses, Revelation 11. Nobody really knows who they are. The best two guesses are probably uh, Enoch and Elijah, because neither one of them died physically. So it's like they're kind of obligated to die physically, and they do uh, before the at the end of the uh, tribulation. Uh, the other guess is Moses and uh, Elijah, because um, the um, description of the ministry they do uh, seems to be uh, very much like the ministry that Moses and Elijah did when they were on the earth. So the two witnesses, uh, they minister for three and a half years, the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Nobody can touch them until their mission is accomplished, and then the Antichrist kills them. And their dead bodies lay rotting in the streets of uh, Jerusalem for three days, and all of a sudden, uh, the spirit uh, jumps into action, brings them back to life, and they ascend into heaven. So now the two witnesses are available for the marriage supper. But we've also got another company uh, called the Tribulation Saints, or the martyrs uh, who are uh, put to death during, uh, probably most during this uh, last half of the trib. Uh, they're put to death uh, for their faith. Their heads are cut off. Uh, that's the uh, method of execution by the uh, Antichrist. So um, they need to get to heaven uh, too. So there is, a, there is a rapture at the second coming of Christ. And then everybody's uh, available in, uh, in heaven for the marriage supper. And then I think all of the saints uh, accompany Yeshua for his, for his second coming. So uh, that's the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place in heaven. We're all looking forward to it. All believers are invited. Then we've got the manifestation and reign of the Antichrist. So we're going to look in various places in the Bible for descriptions of him, and a lot of them are going to be symbolic. Like Revelation 13, 1 to 9 says, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. A beast is a reference to the Antichrist. It was also the nickname of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Uh, remember at the time the uh, denominations of Judaism, the sects of Judaism were born. Uh, he committed like a... Uh, uh, a anti-type of the uh, abomination of desolation. So I saw a beast come out of the sea with 10 horns and seven heads. Uh, on its horns were the uh, 10 royal crowns and on its heads blasphemous names. I've got our little uh, satanic chart here because I want to show that, uh, yes, the, uh, uh, the enemy of our soul, Satan, has been busy since the cross by uh, his tactic during the church age is uh, demonic uh, and seducing spirits, trying to lead us astray, trying to uh, shake us uh, from our faith and confidence in Yeshua. And then he will also uh, be uh, active during the tribulation as the beast. And here's a little tiny picture of the uh, this uh, ten-horned, seven-headed animal, which John saw in prophecy. The beast I saw was like a leopard, but with feet like those of a bear and uh, a mouth like the mouth of a lion. To it, the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan, Lucifer, the devil. Uh, Satan gave it, the beast, its power. So the Antichrist is powered by Satan. Its throne and great authority all come from Satan. One of the heads of the beast, one of those seven heads appeared to have received a fatal wound. Some people say that that means that the Antichrist will, will suffer a, uh, a fatal wound or a uh, potentially fatal wound and then either be healed miraculously or raised back to life. That may be the case. It may be a reference to a kingdom which has fallen and then kind of revives. 
Uh, I think it could be the uh, kingdom of Greece. Uh, but its fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth followed after the beast in amazement. They worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who's like the beast? Who can fight against it? These are all things that people in the world should be saying about God, but they're saying it about the Antichrist and about uh, Satan who gives him his power. It was given, uh, the beast was given a mouth, speaking arrogant blasphemies. And it was given authority to act for 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. So the, the beast is exposed in the uh, midpoint of the tribulation, and he exercises his satanic authority for 42 months or three and a half years, exactly. So it opens its mouth in blasphemies against God to insult his name, that would be the name Yahweh, and his Shekinah, that is his presence, or it's also the word for his tabernacle or temple, his dwelling place. Uh, this is the word that was used in Genesis when God placed himself at the door of the uh, uh, door of the Garden of Eden um, uh, between the uh, Karuvim, between the cherubim. So the, here's the Shekinah of uh, God showing up again. And those living in heaven, it was allowed to make war on God's holy people, the beast was, and to defeat them. And it was given authority over every tribe people, language, and nation. Tribe here is not a reference necessarily to the 12 tribes of Israel. It would be all the tribes of the earth. But the tribulation will be a special time of focused suffering uh, for the, for the non-believing Jewish uh, people, for the Pharisaic Jews. Everyone living on the earth will worship it, the beast, except those whose names are written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb slaughtered before the world was founded. So the plan of salvation uh, was operative uh, in God's mind and his plan even before the world was uh, created. Those who have ears, uh, let them hear. So that's the manifestation and reign of Antichrist. Some other passages that address this. So 2 Thessalonians 2, this is from the New Testament. But in connection with the coming of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, and our gathering to meet him, that would be a reference to the rapture. Uh, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day will not come uh, until after the apostasy. Now, this is a, uh, so in other words, the Great Tribulation is not going to start until after the apostasy. It's the Greek word apostasia, sounds very familiar. So our English word apostasy have just come over from the, the Greek. The actual literal meaning of this word is departure. Now, it has come to mean, a derived meaning of apostasia is apostasy, which is a very narrow, derived uh, interpretation or understanding of the meaning of apostasia. Uh, that means to depart from orthodoxy. Uh, in other words, to commit heresy. So it may mean until uh, the tribulation won't start until after the apostasy. And uh, this age we're living in, this uh, age of the church of uh, Laodicea, hot and cold, God spewing us out of his uh, mouths, is definitely apostasy. And the New Testament prophecies are very clear that an apostasy will happen before the tribulation begins. So it could be an apostasy. But if it means the basic meaning until after the departure, what's the departure? It's the rapture. Uh, it is all the saints being caught up, departing earth bound for heaven uh, in, in resurrection bodies. So this may be confirming that the tribulation won't start until the departure or the rapture has taken place. And the man who separates himself from Torah, that's the man of sin, um, <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Stein in his trans, uh, Stern, rather, in his translation, instead of saying the man of sin, has translated this, the man who separates himself from Torah, or from God's will, God's revealed will. Uh, that guy must be revealed, uh, the one destined for doom. And he won't be revealed to people until the midpoint, when he breaks a covenant that he makes with uh, the world, but especially Israel. He will oppose himself to everything that people call a god and make an object of worship. So he will be an atheist 
and he will oppose not only Christianity and Judaism, but all religion, everything that people call God. He will put himself above them all so that he will sit in the temple of God and proclaim that he himself is God. That's what Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth did. People thought it was the abomination of desolation. That is what the Antichrist will do also, and it will be the abomination of desolation. And now you know what is restraining him. So why hasn't the Antichrist emerged on the scene yet? He's being restrained so that he may be revealed in his own time. For already this separating from Torah, this man of sin is at work secretly, but it will be secretly only until he who is restraining is out of the way. So who is this one who is restraining? Some people say it's human government. Some people say it's the church. But what it really is, is an individual. It is the Holy Spirit working in and through um, uh, believers in Yeshua at this point in history, uh, but also just working supernaturally in, in the world. Uh, then the one who embodies separation from Torah will be revealed. The one, uh, the Lord Yeshua will slay with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the glory of his coming. That would be a second coming. When this man who avoids Torah comes, the adversary will, uh, the adversary is Satan who empowers the man of sin. Uh, will give him power to work all kinds of fa false miracles, signs, and wonders. Remember we said before, anybody can use the name of Yeshua to uh, work signs and wonders. So they don't have to be believers in Yeshua. So don't go by miracle signs and wonders. In this case, the miracles are going to be powered by Satan. That's how the um, Antichrist will do his miracles. Uh, he will enable him. Uh, Satan will enable the man of sin uh, to deceive in all kinds of wicked ways those who are headed for destruction, for hell, because they would not receive the love of the truth uh, that could have saved them. This is why God has caused them to go astray so that uh, they will believe the lie. The result will be that all who have not believed the truth but have taken pleasure in their wickedness will be condemned. So stop sinning, get right with God, go to heaven and avoid all of this mess. Another um, uh, a couple of verses about the manifestation, manifestation and reign of Antichrist. Daniel had a vision in uh, chapter 7 and also in chapter 9 that we'll look at briefly. Uh, verse 24 of uh, Daniel 7, as for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise. That will be the revived Roman Empire. And yet another will arise after them. That's the Antichrist. Now, he will be different from the other ones, and he will put down three kings. I think I said when we looked at this prophecy before that I thought it was uh, probably Israel, Lebanon, and uh, maybe Egypt would be the like the first three to uh, fall. He will speak words against the Most High and try to exalt the Holy Ones of the Most High. Uh, he will attempt uh, to alter the seasons and the law, and the Holy Ones will be handed over to him for a time, times, and a half a time. How long did we say that was? Three and a half years. Time is singular. That's one uh, year. Times is actually dual. So that's two more years. So that's three. And then a half a time would be a half a year. But when the court goes into session, he will be stripped of his rulership. In other words, when God begins to judge this man of sin, the Antichrist will be stripped of his rulership, which will be which will be consumed and completely destroyed. That's the rock that hits the feet of the statue in Daniel from chapter 2. Then the kingdom, the rulership, and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the holy people, that's us, of the Most High God, that's uh, our God. Their kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all the rulers of the earth will serve them. Uh, some people object that there can't be a millennium because the millennium is only a thousand years, but it's just the first thousand years of this ongoing everlasting kingdom. So after the thousand years, the, the kingdom of heaven doesn't go away. It just becomes the kingdom of God, which is the eternal universal rule of God over all of his creation. Daniel 9, 27, we're going to... Uh, Chapter 9, which is the uh, prophecy of the uh, 70 weeks of Daniel. We studied this from kind of an Old Testament perspective, but here we're looking at the 70th week, which is the Great Tribulation, uh, the last seven years divided into two segments of uh, half a week, uh, 1260 days, 
time, times and a half time, and so forth. So we're talking about the great tribulation. He, the Antichrist, will make a strong covenant with many for one week of years, most prominently with uh, Israel. Uh, presidents throughout my lifetime have been trying to uh, work a peace deal in the Middle East between, basically, between Israel and the uh, Palestinians uh, unsuccessfully. Donald Trump uh, probably had the most success of anybody, but now he's gone. So um, the peace deal is going to turn out to be a sign that the tribulation is about to uh, begin. So uh, be careful how you cheer on these efforts for a peace treaty. For half of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and uh, grain offering. So the, in the second half of the tribulation, the, um, the temple will be uh, desecrated and the abomination of desolation will take place. So because of that, sacrifice and grain offering will stop. It stopped for the Essenes when Antiochus Epiphanes IV uh, desecrated the temple. On the wing of detestable things, the desolator will come and continue until uh, the already decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. So uh, Antichrist is going to do what he is uh, destined uh, to, uh, to do until Jesus judges him and removes him uh, from the scene. <clears throat> Let me move my picture way over here, kind of out of the way. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, return of Christ, the second coming of Christ, and the battle of Armageddon, which transpires. <clears throat> uh, Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Well, I'll tell you what. Let me read uh, from Zechariah first, and then we will read about the, uh, the second coming. Nope, I take that back. We're going to read Revelation first. 19, verses 11 through 16. Next, I, John saw heaven open, and there before me was a white horse. Sitting on it was the one called Faithful and True. Who's that? Yep, it's Yeshua, Jesus, and is in righteousness, and he passes judgment and goes to battle. His eyes are like a fiery flame, and on his head were many royal crowns, and he had a name written which no one knew but himself. He was wearing a robe that had been soaked in blood, the blood of his enemies. He's been in battle. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Remember John's gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, uh, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike uh, down the nations. Uh, some artists have tried to depict uh, a literal sharp sword coming out of his mouth. This is figurative for the Word of God. Uh, Jesus does not conquer his enemies with a sword. It would take too long. He uses the word of God, and what he utters takes place. He will rule them with a staff of iron. It is he who treads the wine press, from which flows the wine of the furious rage of Adonai, the God of heaven's armies. You may be uh, familiar with the battle hymn of the Republic. He has uh, loosed the faithful and the interpreter. Um, uh, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of glory. He is tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. This is where that uh, hymn comes from. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Here is Zechariah, the prophet's uh, description of the battle of Armageddon. This is where um, the, the enemies of God have come to fight with God, and God uh, uh, goes down to earth to fight with them. Look, a day is coming for Adonai when your plunder, Yerushalayim, will be divided right there within you. For I will gather all the nations against Yerushalayim for war. The city will be taken. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Jerusalem will be conquered by the Antichrist. Then Adonai will go out and fight against those nations, fighting as on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies to the east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west to make a huge valley. Half the mountain will move toward the north and half of it to the south. Then Adonai, my God, will come to you with all his holy ones. When Jesus returns in power and great glory, we'll be with him. The angels will be with him, and, and we saints, resurrected saints, will be. Then Adonai will be king over the whole world. On that day, Adonai will be the only one and his name will be the only name. 
So that brings us to the end of the uh, Age of Grace. We've uh, gone uh, through the life and ministry of Jesus, uh, the Age of the Church, and the coming future uh, Great Tribulation. So uh, I know this has been a long video. I uh, uh, hope it hasn't been uh, too difficult for you to, uh, to, uh, to go through. Let me give you the uh, blessing um, <clears throat> from the uh, New Testament, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. That's it for today. Hope to see you next time for our last session of the Bible on one foot.